We know the Euclidean algorithm. Um, in Z, in the integers, and in the Gaussian integers, uh, and not in the root minus 5 integers. Uh oh. That's better. Oh, what happened? No, we were good before. Let's see. There we go. Okay. The Euclidean algorithm in the integers and the Gaussian integers. Not in this thing. This is the this is our, our field where two divides one plus root minus five times one minus root minus five, but two does not divide one plus root minus five, and two also does not divide one minus root minus five. Okay, so we know the Euclidean algorithm. We've seen some, w which implies, at least in the case of the integers, the unique factorization. The same argument we'll, we'll do later will give us that in the Gaussian integers. And it's very much not true in Z adjoin root minus five. Did we discuss why last time? Did we sort of look at the geometry? Why don't we have a division algorithm? So there's no good division algorithm. Because if we want, remember what the division algorithm, this is where everything that we've done so far comes from. If these are all in, let's call this ring R, so I don't have to write it every time. So in this ring, Z adjoint root minus five, if we're given N and M and we're trying to find a Q, what would we do? No good division algorithm. So given N and M, try to find Q and R with are smaller, right? With like, well, we could use complex absolute value. There's a, there is a norm here. What's the natural norm here? Let's say with norm of R strictly smaller than norm of M, that's what we would want, right? If M isn't zero, then we would want such a thing. But what should norm here be, where the norm of a real number x plus root minus 5 times a real number y Any guesses, Daniel? x squared plus 5y squared. Perfect. It's, the, it's again the absolute value squared of this complex number, so x squared plus 5y squared. Right? That's a different quadratic form than the one we are looking to study. We're looking to study right now sums of two squares, but this is a good kind of uh, cautionary tale about what can happen in other rings. Okay, So we're trying to get a strictly smaller value of this complex absolute value. So what did we do last time in the Gaussian integers? In the Gaussian integers, we looked at n over m n over m, that's a fraction now. That's just some complex number. And took, took q to be nearest, or a nearest uh, element of, of r. Right? So again, here's our, our lattice r, this z adjoint root minus 5. In the x direction, we can shift by 1. In the y direction, we can shift by root 5. Right, Alex? OK, so this is root 5, and this is 1. So here's our lattice. We get some point n over m. What's the farthest it could be? So the distance n over m to q could be as large as Root, yeah, um, so we could go halfway here, root a half squared, plus we could go halfway here, root 5 over 2 squared, root 5 over 2 squared. 
Does everybody see that? If we're right in the middle of this lattice, then the biggest distance we could get for this would be this, and this root five over two squared, well that's a, a five and one is a six, six over four. This is square root of six fourths. And square root, and well, six fourths is bigger than one, so its square root is bigger than one. So this distance is bigger than one, and if you remembered what we did, um, so if, if r is, if, if uh, we're supposed to match this equation, r is supposed to be n minus m cubed. So the absolute value of r is supposed to be the absolute value of n minus m cubed. But the absolute value of n minus m cubed is the absolute value of m times the absolute value of n over m minus q. This is just as complex numbers. I'm factoring out an m. And this could be bigger than one. There could be nothing, there's no better q that you have if you're right in the middle of this lattice. In other words, if I draw unit circles, maybe this is an even better way to illustrate. If I draw these unit circles, oops, unit circles around lattice points, I miss. Oops. Okay, you get the point? There's, there are places that are missing. And if there are places that are missing, then you can't always do the division algorithm. So if you can't do the division algorithm, you can't run the Euclidean algorithm, you can't make it a principal ideal domain, you don't have unique factorization. That's everything that's going wrong in this. It's the geometry of this ring, of this lattice, that's not allowing us unique factorization. Okay, does that, does that kind of make sense? Okay, the point is this is bigger than one. And so we can't always make the norm of R strictly smaller than the norm of N. When we do this division algorithm, we don't get a remainder. The remainder is bigger than the thing you divided by. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so, so the point is um, two should not be what we call a prime. But it, is, it has a, another property which is called irreducibility. So let's go back to general rings. In a general ring, a little bit of uh, notation. In a general ring, uh, we already talked about units. So we have a, a ring R. Um, the, the set of units, although it's a group, maybe that's a good exercise, the group of units is usually denoted R cross is the set of elements in R for which, what does it mean to be a unit? Karen? You can multiply it. There is something in the ring that you can multiply by and get one, right? That's the group of units. In a general ring, the group of units is this. So that's what it means to be a unit. A unit is an invertible, multiplicatively invertible element. Okay? And then here's a few more definitions. Definition, um, an element, an element R in R is called irreducible. Ah, there's one more definition I wanted before. That's okay. That's okay. If, um, all right, let me pause this definition. Let me do one, one other definition in a second. Uh, two elements, two elements R and S in a ring are called associates, are called associates. So, R and S are associates if there exists a unit, if there exists a U in the unit group such that R is equal to U times S. Okay? If two numbers differ by a unit, then they're associate, like seven and negative seven in the unit in the integers. Negative one is a unit, so seven and negative seven, they're like the same. They're associated. They're not the same. They're not the same number, but they're they're uh, right. They have the same absolute value. They're they're kind of 
Uh, well, yeah. Uh, let me give you some exercises. Let me give you some, there's some, some important exercises here. I have to think about when they're going to be due. Can I make them due Tuesday? Or you don't want homework on top of them midterm? So I'll make them due Friday. Okay, fine. As usual. As usual. Although it'd be good if you did them by Tuesday so that you had a chance to try them out and see if you could improve it. Alright, exercise one. Exercise one. I said it's a group of units, so prove that R cross is a group under multiplication. So what do you have to do to prove that it's a group? You need that the, the product of two things there is there and that anything there has an inverse. Well, anything there has an inverse by definition. Right? If you have a u in, in the group of units, then there exists some v, which is invertible. By the way, v is also a unit for, this, for the same reason. So that part's easy. The question is, if I have two units, how come their product is also a unit? Why is the product of two invertible things invertible? I'll let you play with that. That's, it's not hard. Okay? So those are the two things you have to prove. Uh, prove u and v in R implies u times v is in r. Okay, so the multiplication is in r, and u is in r implies, well, u inverse is in r. u inverse is in r. By which I mean the thing that you have to multiply u by to get one. So this is automatic. I'll let you, I'll let you play with it. That's exercise one. Exercise two, um, exercise two, So, uh, is a question, are 2 plus i and 2 minus i associates in the Gaussian integers? <coughs> Bless you. So what does this mean? I have two numbers, 2 plus i and 2 minus i. Those are two elements, r and s. Does there exist a unit so that the unit times r is equal to s? I'll let you think about that. So try it. Try taking, well, you know what the, your last homework was, what is the unit group? So you can just try all four and see if it works. Okay? So having the same, so the answer is no. Uh, having the same uh, norm does not mean that you're associate, but it's certainly if you, are, if you are associate, then you have to have the same, if there is a norm. In general, there's not necessarily, not all rings have norms. Okay. So an element R is called irreducible if, let's go all the way back to what I started to say, if, um, let's say B divides R implies one of two things, either B is a unit or B is associate to R. This is the unit group. Okay, let's read this again. An element R is irreducible if whenever you have a divisor, that, I, that divisor is either a unit or it's associate to you. That's what we used to think of as prime, right? The only divisors are itself or one. The only divisors are itself, well, of course, anything that's associate is going to be a divisor, or one, and a unit is a divisor. Okay, so that's what it means to be irreducible. And then definition, an element, an element R in R is prime if um, R divides S times T 
implies r divides s or r divides t, or both. It's not exclusive one. Okay? So we used we we thought of these two things as the same, and they are the same in rings that have a division algebra, in Euclidean rings. But that's what's going wrong in z adjoint root minus 5. So 2 is irreducible, but 2 is not prime. Let's write that down. So in r equals z adjoint root minus 5, 2 is irreducible. There's no way to write 2 if you have a divisor of 2 in this ring, that divisor is either a unit or it's associate to, to 2. Okay? Oh, um, I, I, units are not prime. And R is not a unit. Okay. Units are not prime. 2 is irreducible, but 2 is not prime. Okay. So, all right. With this discussion and with the Euclidean algorithm in the Gaussian integers, we have all the tools that we need to answer the question, which primes can be expressed as sum of two squares? We can go all the way back. What the hell does that question have to do with all this nonsense that we've been doing? all the way back to you think I'm just jumping around to different topics no these are all gonna come together right now which primes or in general which numbers but as you see in a second if we understand it for primes then we understand everything are sums of two squares Okay, we already know something. What do we already know? So there's three kinds of primes. Dependro? Right, already know. We already know, no. If P is congruent to three mod four, then P is not equal to a sum of two squares. Because no number congruent to 3 mod 4 is a sum of 2 squares. We already proved that. Just by looking mod 4. Uh, 2, there are three kinds of primes. The prime 2, the oddest prime, the weirdest prime, the only one that's not odd, the ones that are 3 mod 4 and the ones that are uh, 1 mod 4. So my claim is that every prime congruent to 1 mod 4 is a sum of two squares. Not only is it, but there's an efficient algorithm for finding its representation as a sum of two squares. So let's talk algorithm first. Let's do first, and then we'll figure out what, what's going on. Okay? Um, all right. Let's do it by example. Somebody give me a prime that's 1 mod 4. Andrew. 17. 17, perfect. 17 is a little too easy because it's 16 plus 1, and 16 is a square and 1 is a square. But it'll, it'll work. Uh, give me another one. Uh, no, let's go with 17. Fine, let's go with 17. OK. So we're going to find, we're going to find, we already know that this is 4 squared plus 1 squared, but pretend we don't know that. And we certainly, we're going to do a huge example in a second, one that you would never guess just by staring, uh, that you can write it as a sum of two squares. Okay? The first thing we need to know is about quadratic residues and quadratic non-residues. So definition, so let's look at squares mod 17. So here's um, x, right? We need to understand what squares look like. So x and x squared. So x is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight, nine, and we'll keep going. What are the squares mod 17? One squared mod 17. 
So this is mod 17. Mod 17. 1 squared mod 17? 1. 2 squared? 3 squared? 4 squared? 16 or negative 1. 5 squared? 25 minus 17 is 8. 6 squared? 36 is 2 more than 34. 49 is 15 more than 34. And uh, 64 is 64 is 13 more than 51. Okay. And 81 is 57 plus 17 is 68, and 81 is 13 more than 68. How come we got 13 twice? Any relationship between 8 and 9? Nine is negative eight. Negative eight squared is going to be the same as eight squared. How about ten? Ten is negative seven. And negative seven squared will be the same as seven squared. So this has to be fifteen. A hundred is fifteen more than eighty-five, and eighty-five is seventeen times five. I hope that's right. Yes, that's right. <coughs> Bless you. Does everybody see that? What's 11 squared? Mod 17. Two. What's 12 squared? And 13 squared? And 14 squared? And 15 squared? And 16 squared? Okay, so the square table goes forward until the halfway point, and then it just reads backwards until the end. Okay? So who are the squares mod 17? So squares mod 17 are, one is a square. Is two a square? Karen? I thought when you did something mod a prime number, though, you're supposed to get everything below the prime number. Or are there different numbers that That was when we took multiples. We fixed one number, and we took all multiples of that number. We saw that that permuted everything. This is a different operation. We're taking all the numbers and we're squaring them. And you can see immediately there's going to be clashes because negative the number is going to have the same square as positive the number. And so we're only getting, at least now it seems, we're only getting half the numbers. So of course, 0 squared is 0, but we're going to leave 0 out because 0 squared is always 0. Um, so we have 16 numbers, and we're only getting 8 of them to be squares, and the other 8 are not squares. Does that make sense? We're going to see in a second why that's the case. So who are the squares mod 1? 1 is a square. Is 2 a square? Will? Is 2 a perfect square? Oh, 6 squared is 2. So 2 is a perfect square mod 17. Isn't that weird? So 2 is a square. So 2 is okay because it's six squared. How about three? No. Nope. No? Nope. How about four? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, four, four is always a square. Four doesn't have a chance. It's a square in the integer, so it's going to be a square mod any prime. Five? No. No? Six? No. Seven? No. Eight? Yeah. Eight is a square. Eight's not supposed to be a square, but it is a square. It's five squared equals five squared. Nine? Yeah. Nine has no choice. 10? No. What, who's next? 13, 13 15, and 16. These are all the squares, mod 4. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them. So half of the numbers, there's 16 numbers total. Take out, take out 0. There's 16 numbers, mod 17, except 0. Half of them are squares, and the other half are not. Let's write that as a lemma. Okay, so we need to understand squares mod p. So lemma 
mod any prime, mod any prime, half of the numbers except zero, excluding zero, are squares. And the fancy word for this is quadratic residues. Are quadratic, because we're squaring, residues, because we're doing, we're not really squaring, we're squaring and taking the residue, mod a prime, i.e., uh, the number of n mod p such that n is not equal to zero and there exists an x mod p for which x squared is equal to n. Okay, let's parse all this fancy crap. I'm saying, how many numbers are there mod p, except for zero, let's take out zero, which are squares. In other words, x squared is congruent to n mod p. So this is a <laughs> quadratic residue. That's what it means to be a quadratic residue, it means this equation has a solution. So if we tried to solve x squared equals 3 mod 17, 3 is not on the list of squares. That has no solutions. But if we tried to solve x squared equals 2, there is a solution. 6 and negative 6. Negative 6 is 11 mod 17. Okay? So there are solutions. So that's what it means to be a quadratic residue. So the number of integers mod p, which are not zero, for which there exists a solution to this equation, is this number is equal to, so how many numbers total are there mod p that are not zero? How many total mod p? p? How many of those are not zero? All but one, p minus one. And what am I going to say? Is this cardinality? Pedro, divide that by two. Okay, half. That's what this half is saying. Half of the numbers, excluding zero, are quadratic residues. This happens in any prime. Let, let's do another prime. So here's an example. Example has nothing to do with being one mod four or three mod four. Let's do p equals seven. Take two minutes and work out who the squares are mod seven. Who are the squares? Who? are the squares. Go, take, take five minutes. How many squares will you find before you do anything? How many of the numbers will be squares? Three, because it's P minus one over two. There will be Seven minus one over two, six over two is three squares. Or quadratic residues. There's no good way of doing this, but making a table. Does everybody have their table? Take your time, take your time. Do you have it? Question or do you have yeah, it? Can you two is the square again? So look at six squared. That's 36. 36 mod 17. When I divide 36 by 17, what remainder do I get? Well, 34 is a multiple of 17. And 36 is 2 more than 34. So 6 squared mod 17 is 2. So if I put 2 in here, does there exist the number x so that x squared is 2 mod 17? Yes, 6. x equals 6 solves this equation. 6 squared is 2 mod 17. So that's why 2 is a square mod 17. It's obviously not a square in the integers. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? You're still a little confused. Uh, yeah, I just need to think about it. So do this, do this example. 
do this computation. Give me a thumbs up when you have your six squares. Still working? Andrew's still working? Oh, you got it? Will's still working? Take your time. Let me save you a little time instead of going forwards. What's six squared? Mod seven. Six is negative one. Negative one squared is one. So you can go forwards and backwards at the same time. Or, I mean, okay, 36 is one more than 35. So six squared is, is one the other way. Two is always, I mean, unless your prime is three, two squared is four. Five squared is four, because it's negative two. Alternatively, five squared is 25. 25 is four more than 21. 21 is a multiple of seven. Okay, and the, so there's only one mystery number. One and four have to be there, because they're actual squares. Who's the leftover square? Let me pick on Connor, since you were asking about this. Is it two? It is two. Okay, so again, the, so we would say two is a, the fancy term is quadratic residue. Quadratic residue mod seven because because this happens there exists an x which x well three or four either of them would work there exists an x with x squared congruent to two mod seven namely nine is two mod seven okay and um, so three is not a square. So one, two, and four are the squares. Three is not a square. So we say, we say that three is, three mod seven is a quadratic non-residue. That's the, is a quadratic non-residue. There is no solution, mod seven. Mod seven. No solution to x squared is congruent to three mod seven. None of the squares mod seven come out to three. Okay, three is a quadratic non-residue, two is a quadratic residue. Two is a square mod seven, three is not a square mod seven. Okay? Let's prove this lemma. How come half the numbers are squares and half the numbers aren't squares? Well, it's clear we can't do better than half. Because the negative numbers have to go the same as the, the negative, the square of a negative number is the same as the square of the positive number. So the, we have to have this forwards and backwards behavior. How come all of these are different? That's the real question. How come there's not more clashes among the squares So proof of lemma. Um, clear that negative x squared is the same as x squared. So we our only chance is to get half the numbers. So it has to go forwards and backwards. So list of squares must Uh, what should I call this? A palindrome? Is that what a palindrome is? Same forwards and backwards? Must be a palindrome. Must be a palindrome. So we can only get at most half the numbers. Right? Is that clear? So we can only see at most half the numbers among the squares, among the squares. But why do we see exactly half? Why are there no collisions? But why no other, no, so why are there no other repeats? No other repeats. 
collisions. Devendra. We could, it's even simpler than that in this case. In this case, what, what, would, a, what would a collision mean? What is a collision? What is a collision? In other words, if I have x squared, comes out to be the same as y squared mod p. That's a collision, right? Two numbers give you the same square. So, so we know we have this. So we we only have half the numbers that can give us squares because the other half will give us the same squares back in, in reverse order. But how do I know that three squared isn't also one or four? So there could only be two squares instead of all three. How come they're all different? Well, let's look at this equation. So if x squared is the same as y squared, we can move the y squared to the other side. Then x squared minus y squared is congruent to 0 on p. But what can we do with that? If x squared minus y squared is 0 mod p, oh, that's this is congruent to y. Uh, let's factor this. You're, you're almost there. Let's factor x squared minus y squared. Can we factor a difference of squares? Sure. x plus y times x minus y is 0 mod p. And here is where what Steph said is going to come in. p is a prime. That means p divides the product of x plus y and x minus y. Right? What does it mean to be 0 mod p? That means it's a multiple of p. That means p, that means p divides x plus y times x minus y. But primes are exactly the numbers where if you divide a product, it has to divide one of them. Okay? Which implies p divides x plus y, or p divides x minus y. This would not be true if we were, if we were looking at arithmetic mod non-primes. But what does it mean that p divides x plus y? That, that means uh, x plus y is a multiple of p, so it's 0 mod p, or, so this is the other option, x minus y is 0 mod p. Do you Karen? Want to specify at the top that x and y are both less than p or less? Just any. If you have any collision, how can we have collisions? You're right that in the proof, the collisions we're worried about are the, half, are the first half. But let's just look at all possible collisions. So how can, all po how can any collision arise? It, can, it arises either if x plus y is 0 or if x minus y is 0. But what does it mean for x minus y to be 0? x is equal to y. Yep. Yeah. Well, of course, if x is equal to y mod p, you'll get the same square. How about this? Uh, it cannot have y. Depend uh, Or x equals minus y. Mod p. It's congruence mod p. So it can't happen in the integers. But, but we already knew that. You square a number, you square, I mean, you take the same number, you square it, of course you're going to get the same answer. You take the negative of the number, you square it, of course you're going to get the same answer. What we proved is that's the only way to get the same answer when you square. So the first p minus 1 over 2 numbers, which are not negatives of one another, must have distinct squares. The first half of the numbers have distinct squares. There's no collision among the squares until you find the halfway point. Does that make sense? So all squares in the first half of the numbers are distinct. So we get exactly half the numbers to be squares. 
half of the numbers are squares, and half, so half the numbers are quadratic residues, and half the numbers are non are quadratic non-residues. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. All right. Now you said, Devendra, something very interesting, which is about Fermat's last Fermat's little theorem. Remember. Remember Fermat's little theorem. What does that say? Other than Devendro? Will? Uh, in P minus one, uh, one. Yes? Mod P minus mod. one. Mod P. One mod P. Mod P. So if we take a number, we raise it to the P minus one power. So any number to the sixth power is one mod P. Mod seven. Any number to the 10th power is one mod 11. That I think we now know very well. Uh, as long as A isn't, if A isn't zero mod P, then this is true, okay? So um, now P minus one, P minus one is, sorry? It's not prime, uh, it's, uh, it's, is it odd or even? Yeah, uh, for an odd prime. So let's say for, for P odd, in other words, forget P equals two, okay? Two is like, yeah, it's the weirdest prime, the oddest prime. For P odd, P minus one is even. So P minus one over two is an integer, is a natural number. So what is, what is A to the P minus one over two, mod P. Weird, weird question, weird question. Let's go back to seven. Example, back to P equals seven, back to P equals seven. Let's make a table table of x versus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, x versus, um, what are we doing? a to the p minus 1 over 2. p minus 1, if p is 7, p minus 1 over, is 6, over 2 is 3. So we want x cubed. Right? What is x cubed mod seven? Okay, one cubed, one. Two cubed, one, right? Because it's eight. Two cubed is eight, eight is one, one. Three cubed, three cubed, 27, 21, six. Six, six is negative one. Same thing. Four cubed? Is it going to go the same forwards and backwards? It's going to change the sign. It's not going to go the same forwards and backwards because it's it's going to change the sign. All right, let, let, we'll come back to that in a second. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Four cubed? I don't want to work out what four cubed is. 16, 64. 64 is one more than 63. And there's good reason for that, which is that if you cube a negative, it's the same thing. So four is negative three. So this, this is gonna go not palindromic, but like anti-palindromic. You, you see that? We'll, we'll come back to that, Never mind. Five cubed, uh, 25, 125. What is it? 125 is six more than 119. No, I know, I know, I'm trying not to use this. I'm trying not to use this. Six is negative one. Negative one cubed. Yeah, 216. Yeah, if you want to work out 216 mod seven, you can, or you can think about six as being negative one. Negative one cubed is negative one. And this is the same, so this is, let's just say negative one cubed. This is negative two cubed because five is negative two. Five is negative two. Negative two cubed, we already know that two cubed is one, so negative two cubed has to be negative one. That's what I mean by it's, it goes forwards and then 
backwards with the signs all flipped. Okay, so this is anti since um, negative x cubed is negative x cubed. This table is anti palindromic. It's the same forwards and backwards, except every, except exact opposite. Now, why are we only getting plus ones and minus ones? And what does it have to do with Fermat's little theorem? Daniel? A to the p minus one over two is the square root of a to the Yes, one. yes, notice Notice that a to the p minus 1 over 2 squared is a to the p minus 1, which is 1. And what are the square roots of 1? Kevin? 1 and negative 1, which implies a to the p minus 1 over 2 is either 1 or negative 1. Because squares are unique. We just proved that squares are unique except for plus signs. Plus and minus signs. Okay, so, the, so one squares to one. The only other number that can square to one is negative one. And a to the p minus one over two always squares to one. So this table has nothing but ones or negative ones in it. Okay, are you ready to have your minds, I hope, blown? Which numbers get ones? Which a have a to the p minus 1 over 2 equal to 1 as opposed to negative 1? Not negative 1. So in this table, which numbers are, are they? 1, 2, and 4. Right? 1 and 2 and 4. Here, the answer is 1 and 2 and 4. Those are the three numbers that get a plus sign when you raise them to the p minus 1 over 2 power. Do these numbers, mod 7, have any significance? Karen? They were the squares. They were the, how do I show both these at the same time without covering everything? They were the squares. 1, 2, and 4 are the squares. You can tell if a number is a square or not by raising it to the p minus 1 over 2 power. OK, that's a really fun so fact that I will not yet prove, um, although hopefully, uh, hopefully you're getting, this is like crazy, this is black magic. I hope, you, I hope you're appreciating what we're seeing. So we're, so. So the first thing that we noticed is, is this fact. a to the p minus 1 over 2 is always plus 1 or minus 1. And fact that we'll prove a little bit later. But I, I want to spend a little less time on proving things and a little more time on discovering things at the moment, just for right now. Fact, a to the p minus 1 over 2 is equivalent to 1 if and only if a is a quadratic quadratic residue. So exactly half the numbers will have this power come out to 1, and the other half will have that power come out to negative 1. And the ones that come out to 1 are exactly the ones that, where you can solve a to some power is actually, it's not even that hard. But OK, let, let, me, let me not prove this right now. Let, we're going to use this fact to figure out how to write primes that are 1 mod 4 as sums of 2 squares. That's all we needed. We needed this little observation. Who's totally lost? And I'm throwing too many things at you at once. Kevin, thank you. Because 3 is p minus 1 over 2. 3 is p minus 1 over 2 when p equals 7. 
So in the case of, excellent question, excellent question. Let's go back to, um, we had another list, right? What about 17? This is gonna be a little less fun to do. Uh, should I make it an exercise? Exercise. What number is this, three? Exercise three. Um, make a table of uh, what is, so, so P equals 17, so P minus one over two is equal to eight, because this is 16 over two is eight. So make a table of, ignore this, of X to the X versus X to the eight mod 17. Feel free to do this using Wolfram Alpha. I don't need to see that you're computing this by hand. Actually, it's very easy to raise things to the eighth power. Because you square them and you square them, that gets you the fourth power, you square it again, you get the eighth power. But anyway, don't do it by hand. Mod 17, forget it. Okay? So make this table. So one, two, three, and so on. And which, okay, so here's the question. If you understood what we just discussed, where will we, you could make this table without doing anything. Uh, where will you get ones and where will you get minus ones? For what values of x will you get ones here? Will. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two. Uh, is it three one? Three is not a quadratic. Residue. Oh, I'm going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, uh, four, nine, uh, eight. eight, two, two Yeah. Oh, These are where you'll get ones, and the things not on this list are where you'll get negative ones. Okay? So this homework is extremely easy, but actually, you know, think about it. Tr really do it. Don't just plug, don't just put in the answer. You know the answer. The point is to feel it for yourself. Okay? But you'll get ones exactly at those places. Should we just do do one example of this to see that three is not a quadratic residue? Let's look at three. Let's do one entry. Okay, you want to do it right now? Let's just do it right now. So what is the entry here? Take two minutes and we'll figure out what this what's supposed to go here. You're computing three <coughs> to the eighth mod seventeen. Do you compute three to the eighth? No. Good. Three. Three squared is nine. So I square that, three to the fourth, nine squared is 81. What's 81 mod 17? Say it again. Yes, okay, we can do the squares from here. Yes, thank you. Nine squared, we already worked out, is 13. Thank you, we already did that. Great, and then we can look at 13 squared. Well, we don't have 13 squared on the table, because 13 is the same as negative, 13 is the same as negative four, and four squared is 16. So three to the eighth, which is 13 squared, is 16. So this entry is negative one. As we knew it had to be negative one because three is not a quadratic residue. Mod 17 is a quadratic non-residue. Cool? Does everybody see this? How crazy this is? All right. So far so good. We're almost ready. So let's, let's see at least by example that for primes one mod four, we can always express them as sums of two squares. What in the world is this entire discussion have to do with finding primes as representatives as sums of two squares? Okay, ready to see? Back to primes. Now I'm, now I'm restricting to primes that are one mod four. Back to primes that are one mod four. Why, how? 
to write them as sums of two squares. <coughs> All right, we need something about quadratic residues. We need something about uh, the Gaussian integers. And then we need the Euclidean algorithm. So we have all the ingredients that we need. Uh, let's do it by example, proof by example. All right, you wanted to do 17, right? Andrew suggested 17. P equals 17. 17 is indeed one mod four. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna find a quadratic non-residue. Step one, find quadratic non-residue. Do we know of a quadratic non-residue mod 17? Three, it's right there. Three is a quadratic non-residue. For example, A equals three. Okay, three is not a square. So three to the P minus one over two is equal to negative one. Right? So, uh, let z be 3 to the p minus 1 over 4 instead of p minus 1 over 2. How come p minus 1 over 4 is an integer? Daniel? P is 1 mod 4. So p minus 1 is 0 mod 4. p minus 1 is divisible by 4 as an integer. So I can do this. This is the, this is the thing that you cannot do with primes that are 3 mod 4. OK? So what is it in our case? What is 3 raised to the um, p minus 1 is 16, 16 over 4. What's 3 to the fourth? 13. 3 to the fourth is 13. So in our case, z is equal to 13. OK? Then, what do we know about z squared? What is it? Negative 1. Negative one. Z squared is negative 1. Why is it negative 1? Well, it's equal to a to the p minus 1 over 4 squared, where a is our quadratic non-residue. a is 3 in our case, which is a to the p minus 1 over 2. And we assumed it was a quadratic non-residue, which means a to the p minus 1 over 2 is negative 1. So it's a number whose square is negative 1. What should we think of z as being? i. z is like i. Okay, let's look at this again. So this is equal to 1 mod p, of course. Mod p. And I'm using equal signs instead of congruent signs. You know what I mean. Everything, right? I.e., I.e., z squared plus 1, let me move the minus 1 to the other side, is congruent to 0 mod p. Thirteen squared plus one is zero, right? Thirteen squared, what's thirteen squared? Negative one plus one is zero mod p. So that's this is true in the integers. I mean this is true mod p. So z squared plus one is equal to p times an integer. P times some integer k. This is in, in the integers now, not in z mod pz. So far, so good? Here's where it's going to get crazy. But 
in z adjoin i this factors as z plus i times z minus i. This is just, well, as Gaussian integers, they're still just integers, and it's the product of two integers. P divides this product. Now, P is, okay, we have to be careful. P was a prime in the integers. P may or may not be, it turns out it won't be, a prime in z adjoin i. But to find, so these guys, one of these guys has a factor in common with P. How could we find what that common factor is? How do we find common factors between two Gaussian integers? Uh, Alex? Euclidean. Euclidean algorithm. So to find common factor, to find common factor, apply the Euclidean algorithm, Euclidean algorithm, to this and this. They have to have a factor in common, z plus i and p. OK, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. OK, um, what is 13 squared plus 1? Example, p is 17, a equals 3, z equals 13. 13 squared plus 1, 13 squared, 169, 170. Oh, that's not so bad. 170, that's p times 10. k is 10. OK? So we want Euclidean algorithm. Now, use Euclidean algorithm on two numbers, 13 plus i and 17. What is the GCD of 13 plus i and 17? Let's find a, a common factor between 13 plus i and 17. Well, uh, are you finding necessarily z plus i, or could it also be z minus i? Could be z minus i. Okay. Same. I mean, it'll give a different. Uh, it'll have a different GCD, but that either one will lead to the decomposition of 17 as a sum of two squares. OK, so we got to do a little Euclidean algorithm. Uh, which one of these is bigger in norm? 13 squared plus 1 is 170. That's not as big as 17 squared. So this is the bigger one. So n, so we start with n is equal to m q plus r, where n is equal to 17. M is equal to 13 plus i. Okay? So n over m, so now we have to do this whole thing. Should we do it? I think we can. Go. Take five minutes. Find a GCD. Let n be the bigger of the two, or what was that? It doesn't really matter, but yeah, take, take n to be the bigger one so that the remainder is as small as possible. Either way you start, you're going to start getting smaller and smaller remainders. But may as well start with the one with the, the smallest complex absolute value. I'm going to try to work it out also. What did you guys get for your first? Did you get this? Is 13 times 17, 221? Okay, and then minus 17i. This we already know is 169 plus 1, 170. 221 over 170 is close to 1. 
17 over 170 is close to zero. So I'm just taking this to be Q. Is that what you guys did? Okay. Let's call this R1. Did you get that for your first remainder? Four minus I? Okay. All right, are some of you done? I'm going nice and slow. I'm trying to go slow. Did you guys get this? Did you do this next? 13 plus i, which was the previous, uh, the previous r0, and 4 minus i with q2 and r2, bless you. Is this where you're getting? You could have chosen a different q1 here. Did you choose q1 equals 1? Yeah? Chain. And then what did you choose for Q2? I'm getting uh, 51 over 17. I'm getting 3 uh, plus I. Exactly. And no remainder. So this is Q2. And this remainder is 0. Which means the, the GCD, once you hit 0, the GCD is... Kevin? The previous remainder, 4 minus i. So this is the GCD. That's the GCD of 13 plus i and 17. Well, that means 4 plus i, 4 minus i, is a divisor of 17. Right? It's a greatest common divisor. So it's a divisor. So 4 minus i, so. 4 minus i divides 17. What must the other divisor be? 4 plus i. That means 17 is equal to 4 plus i times 4 minus i. Wait a second. That's a difference of two squares. That's 4 squared plus 1 squared. We have just written 17 as a sum of two squares. Is that crazy? Okay, let's do one more example. We'll make it a huge one and we'll let the computer do all the arithmetic. All right, so, so what are the steps? Step one, find a quadratic non-residue. Set z equal to half of that power, which we can because p is one mod four. Then step two, well, let me put it here. So, so step two, let z equal a to the p minus 1 over 4 and find the GCD by the Euclidean algorithm of z plus i and p. And then you're done. Pretty simple. All right, let's do an example. big. Okay, Wolfram Alpha. Great. Can you see this? 
Okay, give me, um, which prime do you want? How about this prime? That's a pretty big number, okay? How is this number, can you see this? 55 billion, 55 billion. That's the um, uh, two billionth prime. The two billionth prime is of size 55 billion, okay? So the, uh, uh, I'll write in the notes and then you'll be able to see the scan, but we'll work on, on here. So take, oh wait a second, there's something we have to check before we can run our algorithm on this prime. We have to check whether it is one mod four. It won't work if it's not one mod four. 80, how do you check if a, if a number is one mod four? It's very easy, because 100 is divisible by four, so that's all gone. You just look at the last two digits. 80 is a multiple of four, 79 is three mod four. It's not gonna work on this prime. Okay, this prime is three mod four. Let's add a digit at random. And uh, 91 is one more than, one less than 92. Let's subtract a digit at random. It shouldn't be this hard to find a prime that's one mod four. The hard parts are coming later. 66, still no good. Still no good. Ah, come on. Okay, give me the previous one. They're roughly uh, half, half. So the previous one is 52, which is good. 52 is a multiple of four. Okay, so this is our prime. Our prime is, can someone help read it to me? 55 billion. What are the next numbers? 497, 497 million. 159,000. 953. Okay, that's our number. That is our prime. Remember this number. Write it down. I wrote it down in the notes. Okay? We need to find a quadratic non-residue. Step two is find a quadratic non, or step one, I guess. Step one and step zero is find a prime. <laughs> that's one mod four. Check that it's one mod four. Okay? So now we can do um, power, let's remember this. Let's remember that. Okay, good. So now power mod, power mod tells it, um, don't really take the exponent and then compute mod, compute it the right way. So two raised to this power, minus one over two mod uh, this, this prime, copy, paste. Ah, won't let me paste, really? Copy, have to do this the grandma way, paste. My grandma does know how to, how to copy and paste. Ah! Okay, so two raised to the p minus one over two mod p is one. Two is two is a square. It's a quadratic residue. It's not what we want. We want z that behaves like i. We want a square root of negative one. So first we have to get negative one here, right? Two is a quadratic residue. Um, let's just stick a random number in here. Our chances are pretty good of stumbling onto a quadratic non-residue because half of the numbers are quadratic non-residues. So if I just randomly stick some, ah, yes. If I just randomly stick some crap in here, raise it to the p minus one over two power, there's a very good chance I'll get negative one. This is negative one. It doesn't know it's negative one. It's telling us p minus one, but it's negative one. Okay, so we win. This is a, okay, so a, let A equal, what is it? 21,345, 21345. So that we chose that A at random until A raised to the P minus one over two was minus one, not one, minus one. Was congruent to minus one, one P. And now we're done, let Z what do we want to do with this exponent instead of raising it to this power over 4? Not divided by 2, but divided by 4.
let z be a to the p minus 1 over 4, which is uh, whatever, this, this is some crap, 4 billion, 4 billion, help, please. 334, 787, 847, 849. Okay, that's our z. And now what do we do? Look back in your notes. We take z, we add i to it. Oh no, I hope I still have the prime saved. Paste. Please, please, please. Okay, and let's compute the GCD. And this thing knows to do it in the Gaussian integers. And the GCD is, there it is. There's the GCD. So this is Z. Now the GCD of Z plus I and P is, what is it? 25. 235, help? 235532 plus i times 4673. And finally, let's put this in and let's see what the sum of the squares. So that squared plus that squared, that's the norm. I don't even have to hit enter. We have written our prime as a sum of two squares, ladies and gentlemen. That is how you do it. We're out of time. Uh